Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Tonight on NJTV News, the verdict on a terrible accident. A report on the Hoboken train crash pinpoints the probable cause and makes safety recommendations. We're in the 11th Congressional District where Rodney Freelinghuysen's seat is suddenly very much up for grabs. Governor Murphy touts his aspirations for free community college, but how and when will the state get there? Plus, with his corruption trial behind him, Senator Menendez gets his big assignment back. And a local Olympic event, these athletes make it look easy. Those stories are more next on NJTV News. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. More than 16 months after a runaway train plowed into Hoboken Terminal, highlighting dangers riding the rails, the National Transportation Safety Board has unanimously approved a special investigative report on how it happened and why. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. The traveling public deserves alert operators, and that's not too much to ask. But the National Transportation Safety Board today reported that's not what the traveling public got on September 29, 2016, when an NJ Transit commuter train slammed into the Hoboken train station, killing a woman in the terminal and injuring 110 passengers. The NTSB determined the probable cause of the accident was engineer Thomas Gallagher's failure to stop the train due to undiagnosed obstructive sleep apnea, and it faulted NJ Transit for failing to properly screen for it. Gallagher's last recorded physical was in 2013 before the accident, and investigators found he was at higher risk for sleep apnea. The engineer had gained about 90 pounds since 2013, which creates an increase in your BMI, which provides evidence that uh, he should possibly have been referred for additional testing. The board acknowledged that since the accident, NJ Transit's implemented a screening program that diagnosed 47 out of 55 engineers with sleep apnea and requires them to be medically certified for duty. It criticized the Federal Railroad Administration for backtracking on national regulations last September. But I'm extremely disturbed that the FRA has withdrawn this sleep apnea screening program. This proposal is unacceptable to me. Besides recommending a robust sleep apnea screening program, the board urged all passenger railroads to develop and implement safety management systems, noting NJ Transit had failed to adequately gauge end-of-track accident hazards, and finally to mandate that all passenger railroads, including NJ Transit, install positive train control at terminal tracks. But the NTSB also reported the industry needs new technology to help stop the train inside the terminal, where PT may not be completely effective. It's complex for PTC, maybe too complex, so we're asking the industry and the FRA to, to join forces and figure out a method to prevent trains from uh, reaching the end of the track. Don't rely on engineers to stop the trains. It, it's got too many open uh, failures. Transportation advocates welcomed the NTSB report's timing, saying Governor Murphy just signed an executive order demanding a complete audit of NJ Transit. What they could do is roll the findings of this report into that audit and make it part of the bigger reform process. NJ Transit's long lacked adequate funding, an argument underscored by Senator Bob Menendez, who said the board's report shows NJ Transit's become the poster child for what can go wrong when you bleed a transit agency dry of critical resources and fail to prioritize infrastructure investment. NJ Transit's response to the report? 
We cooperated fully with the NTSB's investigation and are pleased that the NTSB acknowledged our aggressive sleep apnea screening protocol, adding it's reduced the speed limit into Hoboken and Atlantic City terminals, outfitted locomotives and cab cars with inward and outward facing cameras, and is installing friction bumper blocks designed to absorb impact at Hoboken. The NTSB's recommendations are not mandatory, but Congress and regulatory agencies generally follow its advice about 75% of the time. In Newark, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. New Jersey senior Senator Bob Menendez has been restored to his position as ranking member on the powerful Senate Foreign Relations Committee. This after the Justice Department dropped its bribery and corruption charges against him. Another New Jersey political stalwart is retiring in the face of his toughest re-election race ever. Police uh, Chief Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron looks at those running for the right to replace Representative Rodney Freilingheisen. Assemblyman Jay Weber is the only Republican to declare so far. He sent out an email Saturday saying, I'm all in. We asked why. Because this seat is going to be a bellwether seat across the country. This control of Congress could hinge on the 11th Congressional District in New Jersey, and it's too important to sit on the sidelines. I feel like I have to get in, represent the values of my constituents and my neighbors, and help keep this seat uh, for the good of our country. Weber has put out a long list of local elected officials supporting him. Veteran Republican State Senator Joe Panaccio was a likely candidate, but has decided against it. Too many variables, he told us today from Florida. You go to Washington, you have to start all over again. Republican Assemblyman Tony Bucco says he's seriously considering it and will make a decision over the next couple of weeks. This is not something that you just jump in head first in. Um, this is a very important seat. Um, I think this will become, now that Congressman Fielenheisen is retired, this will become a bellwether seat uh, for the country. And, um, and that's an important decision to make. We have to have the right candidate who is uh, able to energize the party. Bucco has put out his own list of supporters and thinks his prospects are solid. The people of the country and in the 11th Congressional District, I think, are looking for a leader, somebody who is willing to, to work hard, tackle the tough problems, is not afraid to work across the aisle. And I've done that, Michael. I've done that in Trenton in the four terms that I've served down there so far, and now going into my fifth. The district has long leaned Republican. 60% of it is in Morris County, a traditional Republican stronghold. But at the headquarters of Democrat Mikey Sherrill, a dozen people were calling voters today, and it's only February. The former Navy helicopter pilot and former federal prosecutor downplays the significance of Freelinghuysen's exit. We still have a hard fight ahead of us and making sure that uh, people understand the message. So I don't want to take anything for granted. You know, everybody here in New Jersey says you either run unopposed or you run scared. So I'm going to keep running scared and make sure we do every single thing we can uh, to let people know uh, what we want to do for New Jersey. Three other Democrats are running, Tamara Harris, Mitchell Corbett, and Mark Washburn. But Cheryl has party backing and has raised over a million dollars, and she's already figuring out how to run against some new Republican. You know, I think any Republican is going to have to run on the agenda coming out of Washington. And that agenda has proven again and again to be bad for New Jersey. So uh, we see attacks on our health care system, rising premiums, a tax plan that hits New Jersey particularly hard, especially the 11th District. And then, you know, reneging on the promise to invest in our infrastructure and in our gateway tunnel. Weber sounds optimistic. For as much as we've supported Rodney for so many years and people were happy to do it, there was no sense of urgency because Rodney was uh, safe. Now that the district's in play, the Republican Party and, and other grassroots activists realize they've got to get energized, they've got to get active, and they're committed to keeping the seat. New Jersey loses something with Rodney Freelingheisen's retirement. As appropriations chairman, he'd have been in position to help the state for years to come. The silver lining is that come November, the 11th district will be getting a fresh face. In Fairfield, I'm Michael Aaron, NJTV News. Wall Street whiplash tops today's business news. Standing by at the Strategic Development Group studio at the NJCU School of Business is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda? 
Mary Alice, the financial drama across the river on Wall Street continued today, but after a series of wild swings, the market did close up sharply. The highs and clearly the lows have rattled investors. Earlier today, in testimony before the House Financial Services Committee in Washington, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin expressed confidence in the market. I'm not overly concerned about the market volatility. I think the fundamentals are quite strong. Uh, I have checked in with market participants this morning before I came to make sure that there was orderly market activity, uh, clearance functioning, no systemic. I'm happy to report that uh, I got the green lights. At the close, the Dow was up 567 points, the Nasdaq rallied 148, the S&P 500 climbed 46. Meantime, the Treasury Secretary appears more concerned with cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, which has lost half its value this year. Bitcoin is an unregulated virtual currency. Today, the Senate Banking Committee held a hearing on these cryptocurrencies and discussed whether U.S. regulators should be given more power to oversee their trading. Officials are worried about investors potentially losing their money in possible scams. When it comes to managing pension money, New Jersey's police and firefighter unions want a shot at it. A bill that would spin off police and fire pensions from the state worker pension fund was approved by a Senate committee in Trenton. The bill would allow a board of trustees to manage the $27 billion in pension assets for those public safety workers. Governor Christie had vetoed a bill to do that when he was in office, but State Senate President Steve Sweeney reintroduced it in the new legislature. We have a glimpse of what one of Newark's latest redevelopment projects will look like. The developers of a 12-acre project known as Riverfront Square have revealed the design of an 11-story tower that will anchor it, which will be built on the site of the old Newark Bear Stadium. This 500,000-square-foot tower will be made of environmentally friendly timber and not metal. The developers are waiting for an anchor tenant to sign on before beginning work on that wooden tower. The entire Riverfront Square project will be comprised of both apartments and offices. And those are our top business stories. Challenging the federal government's proposed ban on transgender people serving in the military. New Jersey's joined a multi-state coalition seeking to have the ban declared illegal. State Attorney General Gabir Graywall saying it violates the Constitution. The brief notes there is no evidence their service has disrupted military readiness, operational effectiveness, or morale. A district court granted a preliminary injunction against the transgender ban in December. A district court judge has temporarily blocked Immigration and Customs Enforcement from deporting three Indonesian immigrants who sought asylum inside the Reformed Church of Highland Park. For the next five weeks, until the judge delivers another ruling, the man cannot be deported but can still be detained by ICE. Opening a conversation about free community college, Governor Phil Murphy and the First Lady held a roundtable on the benefits of offering it but the Senate minority leader is already wondering how we're going to pay for it. Brianna Vernozzi reports. Surrounded by students from Rowan College at Burlington County, Phil Murphy renewed his higher education pledge, free tuition at every community college throughout all 21 counties in the state. If you talk about free community college for all, which sounds like, oh my Lord, that's a big sticker shock. And in fact, we think it's about a $200 million annual investment or expense and I can't think of a better way to spend that money than to try to achieve that aspiration. To emphasize his point, several students were invited to share personal stories, focusing on affordability and accessibility. It definitely wasn't my first thought, you know, going out of, coming out of high school, being in a, in a home with a single mom, you know what I mean? Um, affording college wasn't really like on my mind. Rowan College at Burlington, formerly known as BCC, is one of few community schools using a new model. Students take 75 percent of their courses here at a significantly lower cost, but finish their final year and get their degree at Rowan University. Today, Murphy was urged to support a bill creating similar programs elsewhere and guarantee financial aid eligibility. We like to see a, a seamless pathway uh, from uh, training that we provide at the 
and 19 community colleges for workforce uh, to uh, make them all uh, go into college earning credentials and, and degrees down the road. I struggle still even with the lowest tuition in the state. I do still struggle. My parents are um, supporting me as much as I can. My father helps pay for my tuition. He has to work two jobs to pay for my tuition and I pay him back so they don't have to, don't have to worry about any interest. I applied to most of the schools but once it came to the price tag it was just not realistic. Mara B. Madrigal is a first generation college student. She calls RCBC her lifeline to an education. I can't afford to go to four-year schools so coming here it gives me a chance to build up my um, resume. But even transition reports from Murphy's administration are vague, doing little to detail a budget outline. We're only now, because we were, we've just been there for three weeks, this is a little unusual, even with an extra couple of weeks to deliver the budget, uh, we're still in the early stages of putting the building blocks together. But it could be this budget? Well, we're going to see. I, I don't know. As I said up there, I don't think it could, you, you get this tomorrow. So the governor's emphasis is clear, and his sights are set high universal pre-K, fully funding the school formula and free community college. The question is, is he stacking his plate too high? In Mount Laurel, Brianna Venosi, NJTV News. And as though I graduated in 2007 and I wish it was free for me um, because now you have student loan debt. I would not mind my taxes going up some reasonable amount. If, uh, if the money was being earmarked for that. I think yeah, absolutely, why not keep the people from New Jersey that you're trying to give this benefit to? Why not invest it into your future doctors, your future leaders, your future lawyers, people who are gonna do something in the community? The State Department of Health will mark tomorrow's 18th annual National Black HIV Awareness Day by urging citizens to get educated, get tested, get protected. Leah Mishkin reports the impact of HIV AIDS is still being felt in New Jersey. She always had a smile on her face. Before you understand why we're at this cemetery, let me explain how we met. Gwen McMillan was getting her annual free testing done at the National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day event. She says she does it as a precaution. And I'm always talking to the teenagers or, you know, from 13 up, be careful. Don't think because you look good on the outside, be very careful. Ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Today, more than 37,000 people are living with HIV in New Jersey. And while African Americans are 15% of the state's total population, they represent 50% of those currently living with HIV AIDS right here. Reverend Dr. J. Stanley Justice says while those numbers are improving, the fight is not over. Even though there's been some progress made, even though there, there are medicines out there to help and prolong life, but we still got to move toward the eradication of HIV AIDS altogether. Outside in the mobile testing clinic, we were told you can go years without knowing you're positive. And I've seen that firsthand uh, with clients. The damage that gets done can be really, really bad. It's tough to get that message out there sometimes. Gwen McMillan says her niece didn't know she had AIDS until she was very sick. That was back in the early 90s before medication to manage it was widely available. I said, don't be ashamed. I said, that's what's uh, nobody won't talk about it. And you need to talk about it. It saved lives. McMillan says she prays every night that lives are saved. As people gather today to bring awareness, she stands here thinking of her niece. I don't know one person that she didn't get along, even the person who gave her uh, AIDS. No, she said, I forgive. A young woman, she says, who had a smile on her face. Even to the end. In Trenton, Leah Mishkin, NJTV News. An investment in Scarlet Night Scholars, that tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Piscataway, where some 700 student athletes will be getting a new academic center made possible by a $15 million donation, Rutgers Athletics' biggest donation ever. The gift from alums Gary and Barbara Rodkin will be used to consolidate academic support services for all athletes and training facilities for soccer and lacrosse on the Bush campus right across from High Point Stadium. 
Next to Trenton, where the Trenton Battle Monument is in need of a makeover. It was erected in 1893 to honor the patriots who kept the Hessians at bay at a critical turning point in the American Revolution, and it has plaques to prove it. But no way to get to the top until three years later, 1896, when a state-of-the-art Otis elevator was installed. That no longer functions. The state DEP says there are challenges to reopening the inside, mold removal, installing a custom elevator to fit into the skinny shaft, which then would require an elevator operator who'd require a restroom. But the 148-foot-tall exterior is in good shape. Finally, Haddonfield, where birdhouses have brought the bluebirds back. The spectacular songbirds have been squeezed out by developers and predators, but when Chuck Kanupke placed specially designed boxes near the Tavistock Golf Course, the birds feathered nests, laid eggs, and have prospered safe from snakes and sparrows who peck at them. The state's Bluebird Society, formed in 2011, strategically placed some 800 boxes, and last year reported 3,386 fledglings, more than 1,000 over the previous year, and reports the Blue Beauties are now taking up residence in boxes at the ultra-exclusive Pine Valley Golf Club. Location is not just for the birds. And that's our Garden State Express for Tuesday, February 6th. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. The Winter Games of the 23rd Olympiad open Friday in South Korea, but some special Olympians are already competing here. Michael Hill reports. Seconds after 39-year-old Jeremy Dobie's ski down the slope, his fans posed for pictures to celebrate his feet at the Special Olympics of New Jersey. Very proud because he had spine surgery in 2016 and has a spinal fusion, and we didn't know if he'd be able to ski again. Tell me, what was it like coming down there? Oh, nothing really, just fast and just rough. What was it like watching him come down so the mountain? So proud, really proud. Like, Were you nervous? I was, I was nervous for him because, you know, I, I dabble a little in snowboarding, but not very good. But he's taught me a lot, and he is doing excellent. And he couldn't even walk last year. So to see him skiing this year, we're really proud of him. Kolb's own son, Arthur, has intellectual disabilities, and wanting a better life for him inspired her to found Life with Joy two years ago. Jeremy is among those benefiting from the nonprofit's programs that teach agriculture, cooking, music, and even mixed martial arts. We don't believe there are any victims. You can go out there, you can learn to defend yourself, use your body. Very iconic year for this organization, this movement, what we call it, um, not only in New Jersey, but globally. And, um, you know, we started in 1968 and with a few athletes and a few volunteers, and here we are now, an $8.4 million dollar organization in New Jersey, offering these competitions and training all free of charge. The Winter Games started in January in South Jersey. This final leg includes two days of fun in the sun, in the snow, and on the slopes as these Olympians compete against each other and challenge themselves, striving to improve and achieve. What's it like, Heather, watching some of these uh, Special Olympians come down some of these slopes? God bless them because I'm not a big skier, so you know it's, I, I, I applaud them from the base of the mountain. But I think it's uh, it really shows their um, it's not even their courage, but their ability. You know, we focus on ability, not disability. So being able to show their ability on on the slopes and on the on the cross country skiing and even speed skating is just a tremendous. Uh, uh, effort up from all of them that are here this weekend. I saw some of them, they look fearless. I would say they're fearless, yes, they have their game face on. These Special Olympians, their families and friends and helpers say they know what the real competition is. It says that there, there are no stereotypes and you can't say people with disabilities can't do things and can't work and can't hold jobs and can come down a mountain. <laughs> In Vernon at the Special Olympics of New Jersey, Michael Hill, NJTV News.
us some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. New Jersey Transit says only 6% of its trains have positive train control. New Jersey's Winter Special Olympics have eight events, including snowshoeing and figure skating. The Newark Bears minor league baseball team was founded in 1998 and folded after the 2013 season. And Congressman Rodney Freelingheisen's great, 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 great grandfather was a framer of the United States Constitution. If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, Newark's top school administrators get a new contract sweetened with raises. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thanks for being here. See you tomorrow. of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE and G, we make things work for communities. Have some water. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member.